it's uh, for ages 55 and up. And I told him that every year it needs to change and become one more year older so that I don't qualify. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I'm excited today about the message and the passage of Scripture that we're going to turn to. Turn to Isaiah chapter 4 with me. Isaiah chapter 4. I believe this portion of Scripture is a foundational Scripture for our church and for our lives. It talks about the glory of the Lord being a canopy over our lives. And there's no place I'd rather be. Amen? I want to begin and ask you, what does the glory of the Lord mean to you? What does the glory of the Lord mean to you? Is it a feeling? Is it power? Is it God's benefits? What does the glory of the Lord mean to you? The glory of the Lord speaks of the manifest or revealed presence of God. It's Him. It's God being there right where you are and manifesting His presence in your life. And that's what I want. Amen? The last couple of weeks we began the new year talking about having a passion for God in this new year. We looked at the, the uh, great apostle, the great man of God, Paul, and and we talked about Romans where he came and he, he wrote a letter to the Roman church and he said, when I come to visit you, I am coming in the fullness of the blessing of, God, of the gospel of Christ. The fullness of the blessing. He, he was saying, I'm coming in the fullness of God's blessing in my life. When I come to you, I am coming with something powerful to give you. Amen. And that was our hearts, right? As we begin the new year, we don't want to live half-empty lives or three-quarters or 99.9. .9. We want to live life in the fullness of the blessing of God so that we can minister to people this year. The next week, we looked at Mary and her passion for Jesus. When, when she came and Jesus and the disciples came to her home, the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Martha was in there cooking and preparing to, to feed the disciples and to feed Jesus. But where was Mary? Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. She was listening to every word. She longed to be in His presence. And when Martha came and said, Lord, you need to straighten her out. You need to rebuke her. She needs to be in here. She's just as responsible as me. What did Jesus do? He didn't rebuke her, but He commended her and said, Mary has chosen the best thing, the one thing that can never be taken away from her. Amen? And there's a powerful message there for us, church. Before we can serve the Lord, we need to come and sit at His feet, come to His presence, and be filled. Then we are ready to go and serve. Amen? Well, let's look at this great passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 4. I want to begin with verse 2. And we'll read through verse 6. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Now listen to this. Verse 5 is our text. Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all, the glory there will be a covering. I love that. That's God's promise. Over all, the glory there shall be a covering. 
that's the place that I want to live. Amen? I want to live with a glory canopy of God's presence over my life. Pouring out His strength. Pouring out His blessing. Giving me guidance and direction. And that's what I want us to, to grasp and lay hold of today. This text reveals that fruit comes from the glory resting over our lives. Today we live in a passionless society when it comes to things of God. There are, our society as a whole has passion that leads to destruction. Passion that's anger or passion that's lust. Passion that's greed. But very rarely do we see in our culture a genuine passion to know God and to have His presence and His power manifest in our lives. And so I'm challenging you as individuals, and I'm challenging us as a church today, to join together and say, Lord, give me a passion for Jesus. Give me a passion for the glory of God to rest upon my life and to rest upon our church and to rest upon our valley. Amen? I want to be that kind of a church. Verse 5 says, For over all the glory there will be a covering. So the text here says that the presence and the power of God's glory is intended for our lives. It's intended for our homes. It's intended for our business. It's intended for our marriages, for us as individuals. Wherever we dwell, God wants you to welcome His glory to be a canopy over your life. I love that. Now, Isaiah in this passage is addressing a situation that he is caught up in. But Isaiah is also speaking prophetically into the future, and it applies to our lives today. And I want us to see that. Because so many times we come to passages like this, and we read them and say, wow, that sounds great. That was a message from the prophet Isaiah to, to Jerusalem and Judea in that time. And what a promise that was. That was awesome what God was doing. And, and so many times in the prophetic Scripture, there is an immediate intended message for that time, but at the same time, the Holy Spirit to the prophet gives words that are far beyond that time that relate to us in the future. And that's what I want us to see. We, we know this because 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 21 tells us that. Listen. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So Isaiah here is a prophet who writes in a poetic way. And in, in this passage, we can look at it and we can write it off as simply a, a, a dual a quote of prophecy. And I want us to see this. Look at verse 3. This is the classic example of a dual interpretation. It says, And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Now we see this type of poetry in the Old Testament very common. Where we have Jerusalem and Zion, and it seems like it's just a play on words where it's describing the same thing. But if we, if we dig into this, we discover that the term Zion is much more than Mount Zion or the city of Zion. Zion is a term in Scripture that speaks to God's people throughout the ages. And, and, and uh, we see this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Today, if you went to Jerusalem and you were taking a tour and you, you were asking the tour guide, where is Mount Zion? We don't know today exactly which mount would be, would, they were uh, calling Mount Zion. But Mount Zion, we do know, wasn't even in the city limits of Jerusalem in that day. 
And if you read Hebrews, Hebrews, the chapter I just gave you, chapter 12, I believe, yeah, chapter 12, verse 18 through 24, it specifically shows you that when God uses the term Zion, He's talking about people of faith, people that trust Him and love Him and come into that life living with Him, acknowledging Him as their Savior and Lord. Throughout the ages, they are people of Zion. Now turn with me to the to, uh, Psalm 87. I've talked about this before, but we have several here today that probably haven't heard this, and I want this to stir your heart. Psalm 87. Look what the Lord says here. And let's start with verse 4. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. Behold, O Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. And of Zion. Notice it says, And of Zion it will be said, This one and that one were born in her, and the Most High Himself shall establish her. Look look at verse 6. The Lord will record when He registers the peoples, this one was born there. What's He saying there? It's the Lord speaking. He lists all of these different ancient cities, but then it says, that He registers those as being born in the city of Zion. Some of you are going, what? I want you to get this. When you begin your walk with God and you invite Him to come into your life, into your heart, to be your Savior and Lord, God, it doesn't matter where your earthly birth certificate is from. Mine is from Fort Worth, Texas. That's where I was born. But the day I gave my heart to Jesus, the Lord registered that Milt Michener was born in the city of Zion. <laughs> oh, come on, church. Come on, church. If you've given your heart to Him, God wrote out your birth certificate and you are born in the city of our God. You are born in the city of Zion. Come on, that's worth a double high five. Amen. Now I know I've talked about that time. That ought to excite you. Amen. You God wrote out your birth certificate and He says you are born in my city. You are one of my children. This is your home. This is your eternal home in the Lord. You are born in the city of Zion. I love that. Oh, I don't, I don't want to leave that. I just like that so much. That's so good. What God's saying in this passage, they were living in a time of moral filth and corruption and perversion. They were living in a time when people thought that the glory that they needed for their lives was all superficial stuff. Similar to where we are today. <laughs> People think their glory is driving a really nice new car or having a really big, nice new home or having lots of four-wheelers and snow machines and lots of toys or lots of fancy clothes or lots of jewelry. And church, I'm not against any of those things. If God blessed you with a new Mercedes, praise the Lord. If God blessed you with a mansion, praise the Lord. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of life. That's what the Scripture says. But those things are not your glory. They are not your glory. It doesn't matter what kind of job you have. It doesn't matter what kind of home you have or car you have. Your glory comes because you are born in the city of Zion. You belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are His, church. That's where your glory comes from. It's living a life with the glory canopy of God resting over you wherever you are. My glory is in the Lord. It's not in what I have. That's where they were in this this passage of Scripture. In verse 2, It says, In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. We're back in Isaiah 4. In that day, I like this, at the same time when the culture 
is saying to be successful, to be somebody, to have self-worth. You need to have lots of money and lots of cars and lots of jewelry and lots of things. At the same time, it says that the branch of the Lord is beautiful and glorious. And that's a prophetic term used for the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. It's saying at the same time, when you're living in a culture that says all of these things are the glory that I want in my life, you can experience the glory of the true and the risen, risen Savior. Amen. You can experience. He's beautiful and He's glorious. In that day, that phrase ties it to the prior chapter. It ties it to the chapter 3 in Isaiah, which is filled with a list of superficial things that people think is their glory. In verses 18 through 26, I'm going to read them right quickly. In that day, the Lord will take away their finery, their jingling anklets, their scarves, and their crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, and the veils, the headdresses, the leg ornaments, and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, and the rings, the nose jewels, the festal apparel, and the mantles, the outer garments and purses, and the mirrors, and the fine linen, and the turbans, and the robes. And so it shall be, instead of a sweet smell, there shall be a stench, instead of a sash, a rope, instead of, a, instead of well-set hair, baldness, instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. And branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword and your mighty in, in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, being desolate, shall sit on the ground. There we see God says all these things that they thought was their glory. He says, I'm going to do away with that. They were going to experience judgment. And the judgment that they were going to experience was because of the choices that they made. And it's the same today, church. If our nation continues on the same path where we choose to murder our children in the womb, where we choose to live immorally, ungodly, and have a passion for the things that are evil instead of a passion for the things that are good, then we welcome judgment. There comes a point in our lives, if our culture continues that, that God must lift His hand of protection that's over our nation and says, this is what you've asked for. This is what you're going to receive. Judgment is self-induced. Did you hear that, church? God doesn't want to judge. He doesn't want to see you hurt. He doesn't want to see us destroyed. But when a nation continues to go down that trail and say, we don't want God, and these things are our glory, then there comes a point that God's hand of protection is lift, lift, lifted from us and judgment comes. But what I want us to see in this passage of Scripture, in that day when even judgment is coming because they've chosen evil, God says, in that day... The branch, the Messiah, Jesus, is going to be beautiful and glorious. And there are going to be some homes, some people that are different. There are going to be some people that are different that live with a canopy of the glory of God over their lives. Oh, I love that. Let's look at a few of the things it talks about in Isaiah chapter 3. In verse 12, it says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. There's two points I want us to see there. Because they weren't looking to God for their glory, their self-worth, it says that they were in a society where children became oppressors, and the, the word oppressed there means to drive or harass. It means for the children are ruling the home instead of the mom and dad. You ever see that in our time? Let me tell you, I grew up in a home where to spare the rod and spoil the child was pleasing. And I turned out okay, I think. Discipline your children. 
it shows that you love us. The second thing I want us to see in this verse, it says, and women ruled over them. The focus there of women ruling over them is a statement against the men. It's not a, a, a discreditation for the women or talking discouragement upon them in any way. It is simply saying that the men were not leading their families in righteousness and leading their church and leading their government, leading their nation in righteousness. So it's an indictment against the men. And church, you know that from studying the Scriptures, God is no respecter of persons. Amen? It's not God saying that men are better than women and so men needed to head their home. That's not it. But God is a God of divine order. And one day, men, we are going to stand before the Lord and we are going to have to give an account of how we raised our children. How we loved our wives, how we how we led our family, amen. And I thank God we have some awesome men in this church that aren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I thank God we're men's men and we love Jesus, and we're going to do everything to, that we can to see the glory of God as a canopy of, above our homes, above our family. And we're going to teach our children about the Lord. We're going to see that they come to church and that they know the Lord. And we're going to live it. We're going to live it out. And we're going to love our lives like Christ loved the church. Amen? There's two or three. Come on, man. <laughs> Amen? Let me tell you, we live in a society that looks at men today, and a lot of times they're girly men. They are. They don't stand for anything. And that's what this passage is talking about. They kind of just sit back and let women take control because they wouldn't help lead the family. And church, we need to be examples, men, of what a genuine man is. Amen? We need to be an example to the culture that God has placed us in a place of headship to love our wives, to love our families, to, to teach our children, and we're going to be held accountable one day. And so, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to welcome the glory of God to be a canopy over us. Amen? And you know me, I am not a chauvinist in any way. This is not being chauvinist, church. God is no respecter. He has a plan for women and a plan for men in the home. And I'm simply talking about godly, divine order and headship. That's it. Let me tell you, every decision that I make with my, with my family, I discuss it with Melinda. Before I said yes to come to Wasilla. I sat down with her and I said, Honey, this is going to be a major move. It's going to be a sacrifice for us. And I know you love your job. And I know you love your home. And I'm not going to say yes, even though I feel like God's calling me, unless you feel the call to, then we'll go together. Amen? Sometimes men, and I don't know why I'm getting off on this, but somebody needs to hear this today. Sometimes we get off on the wrong track, men, and think because God's placed us in a place of headship that we're little Lloyd Fauntleroy's and dictators. And that is not Scripture. Oh, I didn't hear an amen from one man. You're just quiet. I didn't hear you. Amen. We're not dictators. We're servant leaders that serve and love our family. Amen. Let's go on. In the midst of this, I want us to see that in the midst of all of this superficial unrighteousness, we have a promise that the Lord will be beautiful and glorious in the same day. The word branch that is used there is used in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2. It's used of the Lord. It says, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. 
Both Jeremiah and Zechariah also use this expression, the branch. It speaks of the Messiah. Here, there appears to be little hope of fruitfulness, but suddenly there comes growth, and it becomes the instrument of provision and protection. Look at verse 3 again. It says, it says in verse 3 that they are called holy. Why are we called holy, church? Because we work? Because we do the things that, that God tells us to do? No, verse 4 tells us why. The Lord has washed away their filth. The Lord has washed away their filth. The Lord has washed away their filth. Amen. If you're here today and you've surrendered your heart to Jesus and said, Come into my life, Lord, cleanse me with the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lord has washed away your filth. Amen. Means you're clean, you're right with God, you're ready to go forward and fulfill the purpose and the plan that God has for you. Amen. The Lord has washed away our filth. And in the midst of this, in the midst of this time, God is saying, there's going to be homes that are different. Look at verse 5. Then the Lord will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion. God's talking to you, church. He's talking to you. He's talking to our church. He's saying, in that time when everybody else doesn't have a passion for the things of God, you can have a passion for the things of God, and you can have the glory of God's presence over your life, over your home, over your business, over your marriage, wherever your dwelling place is. At your business, in the plane when you travel. In a business meeting, wherever you go, you can go with the assurance that God's glory is a canopy over your life. This text uses the word create. It's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's barah. Barah in the Hebrew. And it means to make something from nothing. Aren't you glad we serve a God that doesn't just have to have elements to, to make things out of them, but He can just speak and they come into existence. In this new year, you may face times where you need God to give you a miracle. You need His presence to come and, and just create something that isn't there. You know, this text says, God is still in the business of creation. Notice that the promise says, and above her assemblies. That's our church. That's the promise of God's glory over our church. Somebody ought to be happy about that. Amen? Somebody ought to be thrilled about that. That's my prayer every day, every week. I pray, Lord, fill our church with your glory. Why? Because the presence of the Lord will transform your life. There's nothing that compares to the glory of God resting upon you. I can come and I can prepare all week. I can have a message that, that, that I think is good. <laughs> but without the glory of the Lord here, it's not there. I can't change your heart. I can't change your life. But the glory of God will Notice the next phrase. A cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. I love that imagery. It's very clear. It's an image of the wilderness journey. It's a picture of all of us going through the wilderness. And it's God's promise. Just as He had a, a pillar of fire that protected His children. And that pillar of fire brought warmth in the cold desert night. Just as God during the day had a cloud by day that, that shaded them and, and still directed them. God's saying here, in these times when, when, the, when the world is looking for all the superficial glory, I will give you a glory that will give you genuine direction and give you genuine protection. Oh, come on, church. I love this. This is a foundational chapter for our church. 
We're living in a time when there is so much uncertainty. We're living in a time where there are people that hate Christians and hate Jews. We're living in a time where, where they, there are people, just as we saw in Paris, if they don't like your actions, they'll come with machine guns. But God says in those times, there's going to be some homes that are different. There's going to be some lives that are different. There's going to be people that have the glory of God resting upon them. And it's going to be directing every step, every move they make. And it's going to bring divine protection in their lives. Here we see it in, in the, the next verse. Says, For over all the glory there will be a covering. The word covering there in the Hebrew is, ku, is hupa. Hupa. I have a Jewish friend who's a worship leader in the in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, he came up to visit me and, and I was calling it Kupa because it begins with a C. And he says, oh no, the C's silent. It's Kupa. And a Hupa is used today in the Jewish community at weddings. They'll have four poles. They would have one like right here and one here and one here and one here. And then they take a beautiful curtain and they, they fold that curtain from each little pole that suspends it. And, and the idea was, was uh, very intriguing to our daughter, Misha. So when she got married, she asked her mother to make a hoopah for her. And what it is that they, they, in the Jewish community, it will be a very elaborate, beautiful curtain. And the people will put gifts and blessings into the curtain for the couple. And the couple will come under the kupa. And the kupa represents the glory of God's covering. Oh, yeah. Amen? It represents, it's a picture of the glory of God covering that marriage. And that union coming together under the glory of God. And people will put elaborate gifts. I've known of, of people that, uh, I've been told that put uh, the... Uh, Papers, the, the not the mortgage, but the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The title to a home, the deed. That's the word I was looking for. They they will put a deed to a home in the coupa or the hoopa for the couple, or they'll put cash or other elaborate gifts. And church, that is a picture of where God wants you to live. Oh, come on! God wants us to live and have our marriage, have our life, every part of our being to dwell wherever we dwell under the canopy of the glory of God that's raining down blessings upon us. And it doesn't matter if all hell is breaking loose around us. We're living under the canopy of God. Oh, I'm going to preach in a minute. I want you to get this church. I want it to sink down in your heart. I want it to burn in your life. You can live under the canopy of God's glory wherever you go, whatever you face. And it will give you divine direction. It will give you divine protection. It's awesome. But you have to want it. You have to pray and ask God. You have to have that passion and pursue Him. He said, Lord, Look at verse 6, and I'm going to close with this. Worship team, you can make your way up. Verse 6 says, And there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat, for a place of refuge, and for a shelter from the storm and rain. The purpose of this glory canopy is given to us in verse 6. The tabernacle speaks of worship. Church, worship is a refuge. We need to understand that. We need to be people of worship. When we come on Sunday morning, we're not just singing some songs to pass a few minutes before the rest of the service. We're preparing our hearts for the Word. We're coming 
and we're honoring and, and showing God how worthy He is and how great He is. And you, you can come and you can worship even if you're worshiping to a song you've never heard before. Worship isn't about a song. It's about a way of life. It's about a heart that honors and gives glory and praise to God. Amen? Music is just one tool that we use to worship. But when we come to church, we don't look, we don't, during worship, we're not supposed to be looking around and wondering what everybody else is doing. We're to have our hearts focused on Him. We're to have, have, be coming and saying, Lord, You are worthy of all power, all glory, all honor. It's all Yours. There is no other God but You. Lord, You're worthy. You and You alone have saved me. You and You alone are my strength and my victory and my power. You're everything I need. And You're worthy of glory. You're worthy. And in this passage, it speaks of the tabernacle, speaks of worship as our refuge from the assaults of the world. And it's the shelter for our storm in life. That canopy, church, that canopy over us is shelter from the storms of life. Let's stand. Church, you know that I love you. And you know that I get excited about God's Word. And sometimes I get loud and sometimes I move around. It's because I'm so passionate. There's not one of us here today that doesn't need this passage as a foundation for our lives in the time we live. But it's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to each one of us. Are we going to be satisfied with the superficial things of this world as our glory? Or are we going to say, Lord, I want to live under the canopy of your glory. I want that divine direction and that divine protection. If that's you, I want you to join me in this prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. If there's anyone here today and you're not sure where you stand with the Lord, all you need to do is be honest right now and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you. I surrender my heart. I surrender my life. And if you agree with me in that prayer today, then church, you're a candidate to live under the glory canopy of God. Father, I just thank you for everyone that's here today. And Lord, 2014 may have been a very difficult year for many of us. There, many, there may have been many difficult situations and unexpected trials and tribulations and temptations. Lord, we may have failed. Lord, we may have messed up our lives. But Lord, in this new year, we come with our hearts open to You, our hearts abandoned. And Lord, we welcome You to be the Lord of our lives. And Lord, we want to live under that canopy of glory. Lord, we want a canopy of God's glory to rest over our church, over every home, over every business place. Lord, even when we travel in our cars, on planes, on four-wheelers, on snow machines, Lord, whatever vehicle we're in, wherever we're dwelling, our dwelling place, I ask you that the glory canopy of God would rest upon each and every one of us. That the world would see that we have a passion for you. Lord, that we love you and that your presence is on our lives. 
Lord, I pray for every one of us here, no matter who we encounter this year, that they would sense that we're genuine Christians, not perfect, but we're genuine Christians that love God and desire to live under the canopy of the blessing. And Lord, I pray right now that that canopy of blessing would begin to rain down not only the fruit of protection and direction, but Lord, that you would just pour out blessings upon your children in this new year in a greater way than ever before. We ask it all in 